Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday, February 15, 2023 meeting of the Denver Regional Council of Government's Board of Directors. I will call this meeting to order. And before we take roll, I have a couple of announcements of new members and want to welcome them. I don't see the uh, list right now in front of me. I don't know if they're actually here. I will find out during the roll call. But our new members include uh, Darius Pakbaz, representing Colorado Department of Transportation, Austin Ward, uh, previously an alternate for City and County of Broomfield, is now the member for City and County of Broomfield, Dustin Zvonik, uh, City of Aurora, and Dustin, please correct me if I mispronounce that, uh, Richard Kondo, previously an alternate from the City of North Glen, is now the member from the City of North Glen. We now also have new alternates who may be here also, and if they are uh, if their member is here, then they are welcome as observers. If their member is not here, then they're welcome to the table. Uh, James Marsh Holshin from the, uh, the alternate from the city and county of Broomfield. Juan Marcano, alternate from the city of Aurora. Uh, Earl Holin, uh, alternate from the city of Cherry Hills Village. And finally, Tim Long, who is the new alternate from the city of North Glen. Uh, with that, uh, Melinda, I believe I've made all the announcements of new members. I don't think I missed one. Uh, if I did, please correct me. If I didn't, let's go ahead with the roll call. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I believe you covered everyone. So <clears throat> I will get Great. started with our roll call. All right. St Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Lynn Baca, Adams County. Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County. Here. Claire Levy, Boulder County. I am here. Austin Ward, City and County of Broomfield. James Marsh Polshane, City and County of Broomfield. I'm here. Thank you. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. George Marling, Clear Creek County. Nicholas Williams, City and County of Denver. Here. George Teal, Douglas County. Abe Layden, Douglas County. Marie Mornis of Gilpin County. Tracy Craft Tharp, Jefferson County. Yes. Lisa Smith, Arvada. Here. Marie Morris is here. I had it on mute. Apologize. <laughs> no problem. Thank you so much, Director Morris. Dustin Zvonek of Aurora. Here. Larry Vidum, Bennett. Here. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, Boulder. Here. Margot Ramson, Bomar. Jan Plowski of Brighton. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Here. Tim Dietz, Castle Rock. Present. Tammy Mauer, Centennial. Present. Todd Williams, Central City. Randy Wheel, Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Thank you. Craig Hurst, Commerce City. Catherine Whitman of Decono. Steve Con Conklin, Edgewater. Good evening, I'm here. Thank you. Othaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Present. Ari Harrison of Erie. Here. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen, Federal Heights. Don Cognac, Firestone. David Whelan, Firestone. Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Present. Lisa, oh, thank you so much, Josie. Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Rachel Binkley at Glendale. Present. Paul Hazeman of Golden. Here. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber, Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon, Idaho Springs. Here. Stephanie Walton, Lafayette. Hello. Jeslyn Sherezai of Lakewood. Here. Stephen Barr of Littleton. Here. Kat Bristow of Lock Bowie. Present. Wynn Shaw of Lone Tree. Present. Deborah Fahey, Louisville. Here. Joan Peck of Longmont. Holly Rogan of Lines. Hello. Colleen Whitlow of Mead. Here. Paul Sutton of Morrison. Adam Way of Morrison. Tom Mahold of Netherland. Here. Richard Kondo of North Glen. 
Here. John Dyack of Parker. Here. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. Neil Shaw of Superior. Here. Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. I'm here. Sarah Nermella of Westminster. I am the alternate Bruce Baker of Westminster. Thank you so much, Director Baker. Bud Starker of Wheat Ridge. Glad to be here. Darius Pakbaz of CDOT. Here. Sally Chafee of CDOT. And Brian Welch of RTD. Hello. All right. And then um, I just will do a quick ask of anyone to raise their virtual hand in case you were not able to respond. Um, I do see that we have uh, Margot Ramson with us. We're going to promote her now. And then I see Steve Odoricio and George Teal. Welcome. All right. And with that, Mr. Chair, I will hand it back to you. And we do have a quorum. You're muted, sorry. You're muted, Kevin. What a way to begin my last meeting as chair. Uh, <laughs> I think after three years of Zoom, I would automatically know that. I apologize. Uh, move to uh, next item of business is uh, to approve our, our agenda for the evening. And so I would like to ask any member if they would be willing to make that motion to approve our agenda for the evening. And I have a mayor, uh, Director Starker. Uh, I move to approve the agenda as presented. Thank you. And uh, Director Teal. Second. Thank you. Mo moved and seconded to approve our agenda for the evening. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. If there are any opposed, please say no. Aye. Please say no. <laughs> please say no and then leave if you're opposed, I suppose. And are there any abstentions? Hearing none, uh, Melinda, we have approved our agenda for the evening. Uh, next item is a report from the chair. The first thing I wanna say is, uh, again, in this age of Zoom, thank you all for being so very flexible uh, on a day like today. Uh, we have members who come from all corners of the metro area. Somebody told me, uh, I recall when I worked at RTD for five years that the RTD district was larger than the state of Rhode Island. And uh, I think Dr. Cog is in fact even larger than that. Of course, what's not larger than Rhode Island these days, right? <laughs> uh, but we come from far flung corners of the metro area and it would have been very difficult for folks, uh, some folks to maybe, maybe get downtown. Might've been difficult for me, for all I know from Southwest Denver where we typically get more snow. So thank you for your flexibility in moving to the virtual platform. Uh, the other uh, remark uh, report I would make is that this is uh, the last meeting for me as chair. And as I mentioned before the meeting started, if anybody could hear, I have been in and out of Dr. Cog meetings since the probably like the early to mid 80s when uh, when I was a reporter at the Rocky Mountain News and Dr. Cog was up on in an office building on Diamond Hill. And I followed you all around. Uh, uh, we, when you went down to, uh, where was a place in Glendale or near Cherry Creek? I remember there's a place there. And then finally downtown, and then the final move to where we are now. And in all those uh, times up until I got elected to city council in Denver, never imagined I would find myself here. And it's been, it's been a pleasure to be on the other side of the looking glass uh, for all these processes and to discover the secret handshake that no one ever showed me when I was a reporter. Uh, so I, I appreciate your forbearance with my, uh, my uh, chairing these meetings, my sometimes offbeat sense of humor, which I had to have to carry me through all the other meetings when I was a reporter at, uh, at the Rocky Mountain News. So thank you for your support. And uh, I look forward to working as uh, the immediate past chair, uh, continuing with the executive committee and with our new chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank Director you, Levy. Thank you, do you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Director Levy, do you? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, and I don't mean to step on those really lovely words at all. <laughs> thank okay. you for that, uh, Kevin, and your your excellent stewardship. When we just now approved the agenda, did, did we also approve the minutes? Because I did want to note a correction to the minutes, and I didn't see on the agenda when when it is that we approved the, um, the minutes. Um, you uh, are correct. There is not a place 
uh, to on the rest of the agenda to correct the minutes. Do you uh, do you want to offer a correction, Mr. Chairman? Well, oh, go ahead. Yes, if, if I Doug? may, under, under consent agenda, uh, agenda item number one is the summary of the January 18 minutes. Oh, there it is. Okay, so let's Thank pull you. it off when we get to that point. You're right. I, I will wait. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up is a report on the performance and engagement committee. Uh, Director Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The performance and engagement committee met this evening and we continued our discussions about the 2023 board retreat in Q2. Uh, as a result, you should each expect to receive uh, probably early next week um, a survey asking you about dates and locations in terms of your preferences for this year. And uh, we will be on a tight time frame. So please respond very quickly. Uh, we appreciate that. Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Director Shaw. Next up is finance and budget report, uh, Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for one of the first times that I can remember, we did not have a finance and budget committee meeting. There were no uh, no items for the finance and budget committee to consider. So that concludes my report. Thank you. That's uh, the, the quickest report I've ever I've ever heard. So I appreciate that very much. Uh, next up is the report of the executive director, uh, Mr. Rex. And we don't want to hear anything, anything about the Kansas City Chiefs. All right, <laughs> my, my Philadelphia Eagles got robbed. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to say. Well, Mr. Chairman, that's my report for this evening. Then, <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity, and uh, it was a great game either way uh, on on Sunday. A little bit of a dull ending at the end. I think, it right. was great, but it was a good game. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got a few items here. I wanted to uh, just get through with you first. Um, uh, the board should have received a survey from us earlier this week requesting feedback on how they believe uh, the uh, transportation improvement process went. As you know, we did four calls for projects over the last 12 months or so, and and uh, it's a lot. So uh, so we really would appreciate you know you you uh, having a look at that and you know what ways what opportunities are there to improve the process that from this time. Although I think every, uh, from all accounts that I've heard, it went pretty well, but we always looking for improvement. So please take a few minutes to complete that survey. The information is really, really valuable for us for, for conversations going forward. So thank you very much in advance. Um, a little bit on the housing conversation. Uh, during um, the conversation we had at our last board work session, um, staff mentioned that we were planning on reaching out to local government staff to continue to scope out Dr. Cog's work on a possible regional housing strategy. Um, and as a result, uh, it's, we will be hosting two listening sessions to hear from your staff um, about uh, their current efforts related to housing and to understand the critical areas for, for regional collaboration that may exist. So the two sessions um, are planned, uh, one towards the end of this month and early in March on February 28th, that will be an in-person one. And then March 2nd is a virtual event. So we've reached out to your staff and we've got quite, you know, quite a great response from them. So we're really looking forward to those conversations, but we just wanted to share that as an FYI. Speaking of FYIs, um, our award celebration. So those who've been around for a while know we host an annual event in which we, um, which we recognize the people, projects, and uh, places around this region. Um, we moved it from, use, it has traditionally been in April, we're now hosting it in the fall of the year, um, but we have, an, as of today, we're announcing nominations are open for awards in three categories. The MetroVision Awards, which honors local and collaborative progress towards the region's growth and development priorities. The Way, Way to Go Awards, which celebrates commuters and employer champions. And last but not, certainly not least, which is our most prestigious individual award, the John V. Christensen Memorial Award, given since 1973 to honor an exceptional individual for their work to foster regional collaboration. So uh, those are open now. We would strongly encourage you to think about people that you, and organizations that you think um, would fit any of those, those uh, uh, categories or reach out to anyone and share this information with them too. Well, of course, we're... 
we'll be sending an email blast out to everyone and anybody, anybody and anything to get nominations in. So, so just stay tuned for that. Last but not least, just uh, we are um, beginning our, our uh, Spring Civic Academy. It kicks off on April 18th. Just a reminder, this is a seven-week academy, um, and they meet on Tuesday evenings here at Dr. Cog, um, and it's designed for people interested in learning about regional issues, and, and particularly useful for those that want to become more civically engaged. Um, so if you know anybody who might be interested, um, you, you know you have... Uh, I'm sure residents in your communities that are, um, you know, very active in your community, you think might might be uh, this something like this might be beneficial. We would certainly welcome them. We have typically between 40 and 50 participants, and um, I think they would tell you it was a, it was a great exercise. So, with that, Mr. Chairman, that's my report this evening. I would also I just wanted to. Say thank you to you, my friend, for uh, for your year of services sharing. We've had had a lot of good conversations and a good and some good laughs throughout the last year. And uh, it was a it was a joy working with you, and looking forward to working with you in in your new capacities immediate past year. Thank you, uh, thank you, Doug. Uh, one follow up on your report: uh, Do you have any collateral or uh, material literature that I could uh, uh, circulate about the Citizens Academy, the Civic Academy? I had a very engaged constituent who was in the last one. He really, really thought it was great. And so I'd like to, and he joined, he enrolled because of the material that that uh, we put out from Dr. Cog on our social media last year. Oh, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I I don't know for certain we have collateral pieces, but I know there's information on our website, but we'll, I'll okay. get you, we'll, we'll get you something for sure. Excellent. Okay, thank you. And and thank you for your kind words. I'm looking forward to continuing the housing conversation, particularly in light of what may come out of the legislature, uh, but most importantly, our collaborations, potential partnerships with Metro mayors and county commissioners as well uh, in trying to tackle the intersectionality of transportation investments and housing and growth. Uh, the next item we have is public comment, and we provide time for each speaker to have up to three minutes of public comment. Uh, Melinda, do we have, I, I saw Randall Loeb in the attendees, and I see his hand is up. Uh, so can you promote Randall, and we'll give him three minutes. Yes, sir. I'll do that right now. All right, Randall, should, you should be able to speak. Thank you. Go ahead, Randall. Good, good evening, everyone, and congratulations, uh, Kevin Flynn, uh, in your uh, tenure there. I hope your next you. activity is just as challenging. Uh, it's always an honor to be here. And I must say quickly that I sent a letter to a number of you uh, regarding the transit uh, decision to increase the police force on all of the um, RTD uh, lines uh, by about 150 people. And I suggested another alternative uh, because I really believe when you're dealing with the crisis we have since 1999, there will have been a million deaths in our society as a whole uh, from fentanyl. Uh, we need to approach the matter of people who are disturbed and unwilling to be respectful from another point of view other than the punitive one in both the East and West Coast, and I think I mentioned this in the previous presentation, um, they have a bolt on the East Coast where I come from. I'm also from Philadelphia, by the way. Uh, and uh, from mm -hmm. the West Coast, they have one around Los Angeles um, that basically makes it possible for people to be safe. And I think the RTD has a responsibility to ensure that people are not afraid to use the system because it is a vital uh, avenue um, for people to be able to get from point to point. And even if they don't have a specific place they're going, I don't think it's our right to basically say, well, you can't go on there. A lot of people have a lot of anxiety and difficulties and they need to basically be treated with kindness, integrity and respect. Um, and perseverance to, in, to help them. And having mental health uh, persons and people who have an understanding of the issues would be much more effective to me 
and many advocates than having somebody basically um, process you um, to arrest you or, or uh, treat you as if you don't matter. And I think that's really going to be a problem when you basically increase the police presence. Um, so please think about this in a more constructive, creative way than is being done. In regard to the housing, um, I hope you're involved with Housing Colorado in this. And uh, I run a group called the Colorado Social Legislative Committee. And I'm really stoked at the idea that we can work on trying to create housing effectively throughout the state. Uh, because many of the areas that you all represent are rural and they also have the same problems of having housing available for people. And near pairing housing and transit, of course, is essential uh, to uh, mitigate the, in, the serious nature of costs. And, and I notice my time's up, so I'll be quiet. Yeah. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Randall. I did receive your letter uh, and uh, took it very seriously and you present some very interesting uh, uh, suggestions. Uh, they seem to be modeled along the lines of uh, what we started in Denver with the STAR program uh, as far as a uh, non-police response to uh, crises such as what you mentioned. So uh, we do have an RTD representative here and I'm sure uh, can take that message back. Uh, thank you. Uh, Melinda, I don't see anyone else uh, with their hands raised. I don't see any phone attendees. Uh, I should have mentioned if anybody were here on the phone and wanted to talk, they would have to press star nine, but I don't see any. Uh, so I agree with you, no, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no other uh, uh, no other uh, members of the public who wish to comment, let us move on to item seven, which is a motion to approve the consent agenda. And here, let me call on Director Levy. Yes, thank you. And I'm sorry I jumped the gun. I didn't recognize that as being approval of the minutes. Um, no, the the uh, the thing I think is missing from the minutes in the section on the discussion of the legislative principles statement is uh, an issue that I raised, at, which uh, Director Spear from the City of Boulder also um, commented on, and that is um, to uh, to direct staff to uh, consider some language for uh, our next iteration of the legislative principles that would. Uh, address the issue of equity in our uh, transportation investments in terms of the geographic distribution of those investments and the kind of improvements that we're investing in, and then also to uh, include in our legislative principles um, some language around environmental justice. And again, with respect to um, transportation improvements and their impact on communities. So those we had a little bit of discussion about that. We we didn't try to wordsmith policy changes because it's fairly complex, but I did think it, that the minutes ought to note that we at least had that discussion. Mm -hmm. And I think we did have um, approval of the board to oh, have staff right. consider some language for next year. OK, uh, do you have, Director Levy, do you have any suggested uh, uh, do you have a sentence or some verbiage that you would like to suggest be put in the meeting notes? Well, um, I, I'll send that to, who should I send that to? I don't want to try to draft on the screen here, but who should I send Doug? that to? Yeah, Doug? Just, okay. yeah, that'd be great. Thank you very much, Director yeah. Levy. I'll do that. Okay. With that, is, is that addition acceptable to uh, to the members? Mr. Chairman, Mr. General Head, not if anybody objects, let me know. Okay. Uh, with that uh, uh, proviso that there will be a, a notation added to the uh, meeting notes along the lines of what Director Levy just said, uh, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move approval. Director Hazeman? <clears throat> do we have a second? Uh, uh, I'll second. Director Wheel. Thank you. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to uh, that the board will approve the uh, uh, consent agenda. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All, aye. all opposed say no. Uh, are there any abstentions? Hearing none, it is unanimous. Melinda, thank you. Uh, the next item is uh, election of officers. Uh, let me call on uh, Director Dyack to give a report of the nominating 
committee. This is item eight in your packet, and you can find it on page 69 of the packet. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And again, uh, my congratulations for a very fine year as well. Um, I'm, Thank I'm, you. I'm more than happy to uh, yield the present past chair chair uh, to yourself uh, after the conclusion of this. And um, um, it's 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 been an above average great year. How about that, Director uh, Shaw? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, again, the, the nom I'm or I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the nominating committee. Um, we uh, we uh, were greatly encouraged by the amount of applications uh, to serve on the executive committee. Um, we we reviewed all of the uh, ap applications or or um, mentions of interest, uh, and we have settled on the slate as presented uh, on your screen. Um, as a result uh, of of this year and this ultimate vote, um, Chair Flynn will serve as immediate past chair. Uh, Director Conklin uh, will be promoted um, automatically to, to chair. Um, and then we have the following uh, slates uh, as presented to, uh, to the chair and to the board uh, for consideration. Uh, Vice Chair Director Shaw, uh, Mayor Pro Tem from City of Wilton. Uh, we have Director Baker, County Commissioner from Arapahoe as Secretary. And Treasurer, we have uh, Director Whitlow, Mayor from Town of Mead. Uh, um, again, thank you for everyone uh, to everyone for um, for, for uh, working within the nominating committee uh, committee members, and um, thank you to those who um, who put in their applications to be considered. And thank you to the board, um, Mr. Chair. I am happy to uh, take questions if necessary. Certainly. Uh, do we have any questions? I think my first question, uh, Director Dyack. Oh, no, go ahead, Director Shaw. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify. I had heard you say the city of Littleton. It is the city of Lone Tree. Oh, uh, uh, I apologize, <laughs> Director Shaw. I was just, uh, I, I guess I, my my head was over in Arapahoe County. My apologies. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, Director Shaw. I thought I heard that, but I thought, well, maybe, maybe it just, maybe I misheard it. It was a Lone Tree Littleton or something. An incredible clip on on my part. Uh, great neighbors of ours, uh, Lone Tree is. Um, thank you very much, Wynn. Thanks for the correction. Thank you, uh, Director Dyke. You know, we could create for you to stay on the executive committee. We could oh. create the position of penultimate past chair, and you can serve uh, along with me. If, uh, uh, no interest uh, in that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you for the offer. Um, uh, us us past chairs. Uh, many years ago, we had a. Uh, a past chair, uh, Sue Horn from uh, yeah. uh, the uh, town of Bennett. Uh, it seems as though when when certain machinations happen, she always came back as a as an immediate past chair. And uh, I'm doing this for for one month uh, because Director Stolzman is now the um, uh, the alternate for uh, Boulder County. Uh, and again, I am I am more than happy to yield uh, my chair to um, the mighty fine Chair Flynn. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I'm trying to remember from last year, we do have a slate as proposed by the nominating committee, uh, but Doug, it, is it, uh, uh, within our rules that I also call for any nominations from the floor, uh, for this? Well, it is it's certainly within our articles to, 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 to accept any, um, okay. nominations from the floor, as long as they were obtained in advance, if, if someone wanted to. To nominate somebody. Okay. Uh, okay. Just to just to be uh, uh, tra completely transparent and complete, let me ask if there are any nominations from the floor for any of these positions. Seeing none, then let me uh, ask: Would any member care to make a motion on this item, uh, Director Teal? Well, thank you, Chair. Um, I do, if it pleases the board, I do move to elect board, board office, pardon me. I do have a motion to elect board officers for 2023 in accordance with the guidance of the nomination committee. Excellent, thank you. Do we have a second? Second, Tim Dietz. Thank you, uh, Director Dietz. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? I think the only discussion I would, uh, the only comment I would throw in is to thank the, those who put their names forward and to welcome uh, Mayor Whitlow from the town of Mead 
uh, to the uh, executive committee. Uh, with that, uh, let me call for the vote. All those in favor of this motion and the election of officers, please signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Are there any abstentions? Hearing none, uh, it is unanimous. Congratulations to the new officers. They will, uh, assuming we'll be in person in month of March, I can literally hand over the gavel to uh, my friend Steve Conklin from Edgewater. So congratulations, Steve Wynn, Jeff, and Mayor Whitlow. All right, uh, let me get back to my agenda. The next item of business, the and the budget committee and uh, this is attachment to g is you find it on page 71 of your packet we had and doug correct me if i'm wrong we had uh, sufficient interest from members to fill out every uh, position that's contemplated in our in our uh, articles and in our uh, organization and so we have a full full uh, slate of members for each committee is that uh, is that true, Doug? Well, not exactly, sir. We, we, we were able to accommodate all requests that we receive. I think we have maybe okay. two uh, available slots on in either committee if they're so if they're so okay. interested. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's uh, let's proceed with uh, uh, first. Let me ask if there are other members present today who would wish to serve on either of these committees: finance and budget, performance and engagement. They meet uh, before the board meeting. Uh, on a monthly basis, third Wednesday of the month. Do we have any interest? Seeing none, let me then ask if any member would like to make a motion on approving the members of the uh, performance and engagement and finance and budget committees. Director Shaw. I move to appoint members to the Finance and Budget and Performance and Engagement Committees as proposed. Thank you. Uh, Director Teal. Happy to second. Thank you. Uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Any abstentions? Hearing none, it, that is unanimous as well. Thank you. The next item, and I'm constantly scrolling through this massive PDF, uh, is item uh, 10, a discussion to select representatives to uh, the uh, Regional Transportation Committee, State Transportation Advisory Committee, E-470, Board of Directors, and the Advisory Committee on Aging. These are the Dr. Cog representatives to those uh, organizations. Uh, you see the uh, the slate before you, uh, Austin Ward of Broomfield, Randy Wheel from Cherry Hills Village on the Regional Transportation Committee, uh, Nicholas Williams from Denver on the stack, uh, Director Mulvey from Castle Pines on E470, uh, and uh, on the ACA, Tom Mahwald of Netherland and uh, Direct uh, Wynne Shaw of Lone Tree. Would someone care to make a motion on this? Move to approve as presented. Thank you, Director Odoricio. Any seconds? Director Second. Harmon. Thank you. Uh, do we have any discussion here? Uh, before we vote, I wanna point out that uh, uh, that we can have alternates. We currently don't have alternates. Doug, we, have, we are entitled to have alternates on all of these uh, bodies or on uh, or yeah. any... Uh, not all, all but ACA. So um, all but, that's what yeah. I thought. Okay. Yeah. The other ones. Okay. Yes. Um, and and so, the RTC in particular, Mr. Chairman. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if we can get you know a couple, three folks interested in uh, being an alternate to that, would be great. Because you know, uh, it, it's important that we have our full slate of five at that meeting. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so if anyone is interested in killing on RTC which meet Tuesday morning before the day board meeting. So sometimes it's the second Tuesday of the month, sometimes the third. Uh, Director Mulvey. Um, I'm happy to serve again as an alternate for RTC or staff, wherever the need is greatest. Great. 
All right, thank you. Uh, Director Teal. Well, Council Member Mulvey took my uh, thunder because uh -huh. I do. Uh, I'm happy to serve as an alternate to stack or RTC. I have been an RTC alternate in the past. Um, four, six years ago, Doug. Um, so I'm happy to uh, uh, return to that position. Okay. Director Conklin. Yeah, I just, <clears throat> I have served on the ACA and I would like to continue that if possible. I think we still have uh, spaces allowable there. Okay. Can we add uh, uh, Director Conklin's name to that list? As yes, part of the uh, pending, uh, as part of the upcoming motion, uh, Doug, does it, should the motion con, uh, con, contain the names of the alternates as well? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, Director Mulvey, Director Teal, do you have a uh, want to toss a coin, or are you willing to serve as alternates on each of those, or only one? I'll defer to Commissioner Teal. Well, uh, tell you what, um, Nick and I uh, enjoy many conversations about automobiles. I'd be more than happy to uh, back him up uh, on the stack. Great. Okay. Uh, so let's put down Director Teal as alternate on stack. And Director Mulvey, uh, we will put you down as alternate for RTC. Great. And Director Conklin will be uh, one of the representatives on the ACA in this motion. Uh, Melinda, if you can make note of that. Okay. Are there any other members interested in uh, being alternate? I saw another hand raised earlier. Uh, Director Harrison, there it is. Yes, I'd be interested in alternate to RTC. Okay, excellent. We have two alternates now for RTC. Uh, Director Ward. Uh, thank you, Chair. If you need another alternate for stack, I'm also willing to be an alternate for that one. Okay. Is that, uh, uh, Doug, is that uh, appropriate? Do we have two alternates for stack at any point? No, we do not. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Director Ward, uh, but we have it filled out already. Okay. Uh, do we have a full slate now, Doug? I'm trying, just trying to keep counting my head. an alternate to E-470? Yes. Okay. Uh, Director Harrison. Okay. Are you saying you would? Uh, yeah, you can put me down for alternate for E-470 if needed. Okay. There we go. Right. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for stepping up. Director Mulvey, your hand is up, but do you have uh, another... Uh, Okay, thank you. Yeah, just delayed. Thank you. So now I would like to uh, solicit a motion from uh, from members to move to report board to approve board members to the RTC, the Stack E470 Board of Directors, and Advisory Committee on Aging, with the additions of the alternates. Uh, and I hope uh, Melinda, I hope you wrote them down because I didn't. I got them, Kevin. Just you got them. Okay. You want me to <laughs> just you. amend my motion, Chair? Uh, yes, please. Amend my motion to what was presented and discussed with those additional uh, alternatives, alternates. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Director Maurer. Second. Thank you. All right. Any other, any further discussion? Uh, thank you, everyone, for stepping up to this. Uh, that I think that's the quickest that we've ever filled alternate positions as well. Uh, seeing no further discussion, uh, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Please say no. Are there any abstentions? Hearing none, uh, the motion is adopted. And let me go back to this huge PDF one more time. And we are now on item, uh, where are we? Here we are, item 11. This is the good one. Uh, discussion of federal performance measures targets. Uh, Alvin uh, Badal Sanchez uh, will give us a presentation. Give me a few seconds to get my screen share going and then we can get started. Thank you.
Great. So uh, as introduced, I'll be discussing our federal performance measures and targets. Before I get started, I do want to recognize staff from the Colorado Department of Transportation who are present. They'll also be here to assist if there are any questions that I cannot answer or that deal with any methodology or rationale around CDOT's targets. Uh, if you've had a chance to look, you will know that this is a hefty presentation. Uh, the reason for that is we're discussing three federal performance areas out of five that Dr. Cog is subject to. Um, throughout the presentation, there will be some informational slides that she's giving some foundational background behind each of these. Um, so if you're wondering why certain data is used, what timeframes we're using, um, all of that, the guidance we receive comes down from our federal partners. So each of those comes from uh, just guidance we receive from the Federal Highway Administration. I will also note that as I do get into safety performance, um, you will hear me use words like targets. Um, I do recognize and Dr. Cog staff recognize that each of these numbers is a fatality or a serious injury on our roadways in the Dr. Cog region. So I do just want to note that and apologies for how clinical that conversation might come off as I present these topics. So I will start with safety. There are five performance measures related to safety, the number and rate of fatalities, the number and rate of serious injuries, and the number of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. Uh, these targets apply to all public roads in our MPO region. The calculation is a five-year rolling average, and I'll explain that on subsequent slides. And then for this performance area, as well as the ones that I'll be discussing later this evening, the federal guidance and the penalty will be the same. Um, targets should be realistic and achievable not aspirational. These are near-term targets, so we're either talking about uh, our, these five-year rolling averages here in safety or four-year targets for our, the remaining performance areas. Uh, for, for all of them, Dr. Cog can support CDOT state targets, or we can set our own for the region. There is no financial penalty or funding restriction for not meeting these targets, but we will face additional scrutiny from our federal planning partners at our next quadrennial federal certification, so just some questions around our planning process. Before I get into the targets, I would mention that this is the sixth year that we will be setting safety targets. Uh, on your screen now is a snapshot of how, uh, related to each of those five performance measures, the region has fared for that. Uh, the desired trend across all of them is a decrease in either our baseline or a decrease uh, compared to our targets. Um, a red X indicating we did not meet our target that year, a green check mark indicating we did. Um, while we are in 2023, we are still waiting on data from the Colorado Department of Transportation. So on your screen right now, it's just an estimate for the number of fatalities in the Dr. Cog MPO region in 2021, which unfortunately was 315. Uh, throughout Dr. Cog, there are a number of different actions that we're taking to improve safety in the region. So it's not just the safety targets that we're looking at. We have a number of different um, actions across the agency that we're taking. Uh, one that we're looking at taking on this year is an update to our taking action on Regional Vision Zero Plan. Um, we just, uh, through the amended tip, have updated these numbers to reflect that there are 182 projects in the 2022 to 2025 tip that amount to about 1.7 billion that are improving safety. Um, our dedicated Regional Vision Zero Planner has been involved in a number of different committees um, peer exchanges, safety studies across the region, uh, and we're continuing to explore opportunities to apply and leverage for funding that's coming out of the bipartisan infrastructure law. Getting into the actual targets, the next three slides will be uh, designed the same way. Uh, like I mentioned, these targets are based on a five-year rolling average, so we are using data from 2019 and 2020, a projection in 2021, 2022, and 2023, and adding those up to get a five-year average. So on this slide and the subsequent two, you're gonna see this same methodology. From previous guidance from the board, uh, there is a desire to achieve zero fatalities by 2040. And so when we set that, uh, started that methodology, that was back in uh, 2019. So the average yearly reduction required was 13 fatalities every year. And so recognizing where we were in 2019, where we saw the number of fatalities in 2020 at 272, uh, we are taking that average yearly reduction product projection and applying that to 2021, 2022, and 2023 to get a five-year average of 256. The same methodology is used for serious injuries. So again, the uh, average yearly reduction to achieve zero serious injuries in this case by 2045 would be 68 every year. So 2019 and 2020 are observed data and 21 through 23 are the projection from where we were back in 2019. So again, a five-year rolling average of 
1,584 serious injuries. And then the non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries is a combination of the two previous methodologies. So zero non-motorized fatalities by 2040 and zero non-motorized serious injuries by 2045. We again take the data that we've observed in 2019 and 2020, and then project out that average yearly reduction required for 21 through 23 to have a calculated target of 330 non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. Um, you'll recall that there were also rate targets in this. Uh, the rate targets are based on per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. So while there isn't a graph or calculation to show you, that just takes into account the vehicle miles traveled that we experienced in the region um, in the previous year and what we're projecting out. The next performance area is infrastructure condition. Uh, Chair, I would ask how you would like me to, uh, whether you would like me to pause for any potential questions by performance area or continue through the presentation. Yes, uh, yes thank you, Alvin. I would uh, like to, like we did at RTC. Uh, are there any questions on the uh, first section, on the safety section? There's five sections here, and I just want to make sure that we uh, can uh, uh, more coherently discuss them. Uh, Director Barr, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chair Flynn. Uh, the, um, performance target that was being presented, is the uh, information regarding fatalities and injuries disaggregated by race, gender, age? What kind of demographic information do we collect on these as part of that performance targeting? Uh, when it comes to our federal performance targets, we're just looking at the, the, the raw number, um, but this is just the floor for the performance measures. We do, uh, through the data, have a lot more information related to, especially like with non-motorized, what mode that might be, demographic data associated with that. So um, staff does have access to that information. It's just not part of what's reported through our federal performance measures. Okay, thank you. Okay, I assume that can be made available on request to- uh, We do have our safety data available on our regional data catalog once that's been uh, quality checked by our staff, and we are still waiting on 2021 data and being able to quality check that with, call, with CDOT. But on our regional data catalog, we do have safety data available for those previous years. Excellent, thank you. Any other questions? If there are none, we can go on to the next uh, infrastructure. Okay. Go ahead. So under infrastructure condition, there are two uh, sub areas, pavement condition and bridge condition. I'll start with pavement condition. There are four performance measures the percent of interstate pavements in good and poor condition, uh, and the percent of non-interstate national highway system pavements in good and poor condition. CDOT's required to set two-year and four-year targets. Dr. Cog's only required to set four. Um, the calculations based on uh, three or four different areas, uh, roughness, cracking, rutting, or faulting. I mentioned that three or four just depends on what type of pavement you are, whether you're concrete or asphalt that we're looking at. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, federal guidance and penalties are the same for all of these. So uh, because these are four-year targets, they're intended to use uh, the best available data on hand, intended to be realistic and achievable. Dr. Cog can support the states or set our own. Staff is recommending that we support the state's targets. Uh, and again, there would be no financial penalty or funding restriction if we do not meet these targets. A quick snapshot on how the state did in the previous performance period, which was the previous four years. Uh, when it comes to meeting your target or being better than the baseline, our federal partners will look at what our targets were and whether we were better than that or whether we uh, were at least better than the baseline. So there are two ways to meet, to show progress in achieving these targets. It's either meeting your target or being better than you were uh, at your baseline level. And across all of these graphs, you'll see a desired trend for being either uh, higher or lower than the, the desired observation or target. When I get into the maps and the bar graphs that you're gonna be seeing, uh, we are only setting performance measures for good and poor. A significant number of the facilities within the Dr. Cog region actually fall within the fair category. And so uh, you won't be seeing uh, that particular data. The performance measures are only required for good and poor, uh, but even with that, the majority of facilities in our region uh, fall within the good and fair categories. And just a visual representation of that related to pavement condition, for the Dr. Cog MPO area, a good being blue, fair being poor, fair being purple, and poor being orange. Apologize for that. Um, I would note that there are more roadways on this map than are on the national highway system, but even with that, you can see a significant percentage of pavement facilities in our MPO region fall in the good and fair category. 
Getting into the actual data, these subsequent graphs are all designed the same way. The bar graphs reflect the condition of pavement within the Dr. Cog MPO area. Uh, that falls from 2017 through 2021. And then the horizontal line graphs are the proposed four-year targets that staff are recommending that we support that the state has set. And so uh, for the proposed four-year targets for good condition, we would like to be above that 47% at the state level and then below 3.5% when it comes to poor interstate pavement conditions. A similar graph related to non-interstate national highway system. Again, the uh, bar graphs on your screen reflect conditions within the Dr. Cog MPO region, again, only from 2017 through 2021, and the proposed four-year targets the staff are recommending that we support at the state level. Um, I mentioned that 2021 date, just in case you know of facilities that opened up in 2022 that are about to open up in 2023, those won't be reflected in the data for some time. So if you're expecting um, or hoping for some changes in some of these uh, facility conditions, those won't be reflected in the data until later in the performance period. And then the second sub area under infrastructure condition is bridge condition. There are only two performance measures for this the percent of national highway system bridges classified in good and poor condition. Uh, that's a combination of looking at four different areas, deck, superstructure, substructure, and culverts. If any one of those is classified as poor based on federal guidance, then the bridge is considered poor. Um, and as with all of them, uh, four-year targets, realistic and achievable, no financial penalty on Dr. Cog, and we are recommending that we support the state's four-year bridge targets. As with pavement condition, a significant number of those national highway system bridges within the MPO region are good or fair, so blue or purple on the map being shown. And that's also reflected in the data. Um, again, the Dr. Cog conditions as the bar graphs, um, looking at 2021, 41.7% in good condition, only 3.5% in four, so um, a little over half of that a little over half of bridges on the national highway system are falling within a fair category defined by the feds. Um, so for our proposed four-year target, we would just like to be above 36% at the state level and below 4% when it comes to poor condition bridges. Uh, like I mentioned, we're recommending that we support the state's targets. Uh, CDOT goes through uh, an entire exercise to develop 10-year forecasts. They use their system to incorporate the different effects of different life cycle investment strategies. They use that. To, they use um, anticipated budgets. They also look at what could occur if there were higher or lower than expected budgets. And um, those targets are then based on, on those anticipated budgets, what those resulting conditions would be, and using that real data that they have on hand. Uh, targets have already been finalized, and so it's up to us as an MPO to set our own or support the states to meet our federal deadline. And then for transparency, uh, also included in the memo, um, and that will be included in a future resolution, the four-year targets that Dr. Cog is recommending that we support. When it comes time to check whether we've met those targets, again, our federal partners will look at both our baseline or those four-year targets and see whether we were better than either of those, and that will note whether we've made progress in achieving these performance measures. Thank you. Uh, questions on uh, this section, Director Harrison. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Alvan, for, for this presentation so far. Questions I have in regard to the pavement and bridges, et cetera, is, is there anything taken in account for the altitude that we are at and the weather impacts that we have that are such extreme that cause those pavements to crack on a daily basis, and we get to experience all those potholes every spring um, and going through the patching process? That and also the population growth, are those areas that are factored into uh, this data? Yeah, so I'll start on the first one. Now, I do know our staff from CI are also on hand who can help answer. Um, uh, one, uh, before I begin that, um, I would note that uh, depending on like the definition, poor doesn't necessarily mean um, uh, a failed pavement condition. Um, that is just a definition that's coming down from our federal partners, so that doesn't mean you know, you're driving on a failed road, uh, but those uh, life cycle strategies are taken into account by CDOT as they develop their forecasts. Um, they do develop that 10-year forecast, but they also have a four-year, um, I forget what they call it, um, program of projects related to uh, asset management and these infrastructure condition for these facilities. 
Um, on that second piece, I would see if our uh, partners from CDOT have an answer on that. William or Jacob? Sure, if I may. William Johnson, I'm, I'm with the uh, Colorado Department of Transportation. I'm the Performance and Asset Management Branch Manager in DT. Uh, regarding your question dealing with like, you know, our environment, altitude, climate, we have an entire pavement lab that sits up on North Holly near I-70 and that's their job to ensure that the pavement we're using is uh, acclimated to the conditions that we have in Colorado. When it comes to the model in and of itself, when we're modeling things, we put things in groups. And you can look at those groups as being both geographic groups, geometric groups, geometry being what constitutes the road, how wide it is, the type of materials within it, how wide the lanes are, the types of usage are included as well. Uh, and you know, naturally when you're talking geography, you are talking about climate as well. So when we're putting them in these groups, we like to deteriorate those things or we look at how those groups deteriorate in a similar trajectory. So it's accounted for in our model. Hope that provided information okay. for you. Uh, there may have been a second question there. I, I apologize. It was more, yeah, it was more about population growth and obviously the amount of folks during the winter time that go up skiing and are stuck on I, you know, on I-70, obviously is one example. But all the yeah, um, you know, as, as far as things like congestion, you know, the, the pavement is built to handle a certain load. Uh, and I, I wouldn't think that congestion one way or another really affects the wear and tear on it. It's, it's more a factor of usage that is mm -hmm. vehicles versus trucks. Uh, the freeze thaw that, that we get during the winter that also affects deterioration. Uh, as stated before, everything is is modeled to account for that. When it, it comes to your question dealing with population growth, our model uh, does include factors for growth in traffic, which is mm -hmm. sort of a proxy for population growth. Right. And then the follow-up just to that was in, in relation, and I don't know how many peers that we have, obviously Utah comes to mind in their interstate highway system there as far as high altitude, is there any comparison in regard to our peers and where we stand with similar sort of situation? Yeah, um, you, since you said Utah, it's just hit, hitting CDOT in a sensitive way. Just had to <laughs> go there, didn't you? Uh, we do, we absolutely partner up with our peers to ensure that, you know, what works for them, maybe it works for us. Uh, when we are looking at, and I'll just say for interstates, uh, we went to the commission today, CDOT's Transportation Commission, and presented a game plan for improving the condition of our poor interstates. And that's really been the focus. And I think to your point, if we were comparing ourselves, which we don't like to do because we're achieving our targets, as well as we have a new asset management plan that's out and it gives us a game plan over the next four years of achieving our target. I would say out of those states that have the ability to achieve their targets, we're probably at the lower end of the spectrum right now. But again, we, we recognize that and we're putting things in place to ensure that we're gonna do better. Yep, no, that's understandable. I, it's just more trying to level set expectations in, in regard to you know, whether or not there's more that we need to do in terms of whether it's funding and resources, et cetera. Um, and how, how that impacts everything. So I appreciate the, the input. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Mahal. Yeah, uh, uh, two questions. Number one, does baseline mean that's our where we are currently? And is it true that only 38% of our bridges are in good condition? The rest are not. How do I read that? Yep, so baseline would be where we are in 2021. So that's not taking into account um, any construction or improvements to facilities uh, that have occurred in 2022 or are expected to occur in 2023. Mm -hmm. um, and on the, the distinction, um, these, these uh, thresholds are set up by our federal partners. So um, while only 38.2% might be classified as good, according to that federal definition, um, that looks, it looks like around 70, 65% are within that fair category. 
So a significant okay. percentage of, aren't falling in either of these performance areas. And as is with fair, um, is fair ahead. still safe? Yeah, so like I mentioned with uh, pavement conditions, um, just because something's classified as poor doesn't mean it's failing. Um, I would uh, also see if William had anything to add on either pavement or bridge being uh, classified as poor. Yeah, okay. I'm, 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 I'm just imagining that when we're referring to these terms, we're, we're being a little overly critical. And okay. you know, as, as Alvin said before, is these condition ratings are based upon exceeding a certain threshold. And those thresholds are, are measured annually. In the case of pavement, every bridge gets an engineering assessment biennially. Every two years, somebody goes out you know, with a PE and evaluates the bridge. Uh, Want to make it clear that if a bridge or road is unsafe, it'll be closed. And that that's, I, I can't recall in my 23 years here, that as a result of just condition alone, we've closed a structure. We've had incidents, events occur where we've had to close a road. Naturally, when it snows too much and the wind is blowing, we'll close mm -hmm. a road. Uh, if there's a fire under a bridge, we'll close it. But as a, a result of condition, just, just from what I can recall, I don't re ever recall condition being a factor for closing it. So if something is in poor, that just means it's exceeded its threshold and we're, we're watching it. With, a, mm -hmm. with more scrutiny, we're really looking at the data and trying to figure out a game plan for how we address those condition deficiencies. Thanks, that helps. Thank you. Uh, Director Kelsey, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask a question of to clarify something for me as I was reading it and because I'm very aware that Clear Creek County is not within the MPO area and it appeared from the mapping that um, none of these um, pavement con condition or bridge condition numbers reflect anything that has to do with the I-70 corridor running through Clear Creek County. Is that, am I correct in that? You're correct. For the federal performance measures, we're required to only look at the data that applies to our MPO area. So this is just the facilities within within that MPO area. Um, there are also other uh, narrowing pieces of this. Uh, you'll notice I also just included interstate and non-interstate national highway systems. So roadways, okay. um, bridges that are not on that system are also not part of these calculations. But that's not to say that we don't have that data available. Um, for the region or for those facilities, but just for these federal performance measures, we're only required and can only use that particular data. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. That, thank you. That's a great clarification. I appreciate it. All right, uh, let's move on to uh, reliability. Oh, uh, Mr. Johnson, do you have a something to add? Yeah, I, I just uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to add to that explanation from Alvin. Uh, I think that what Dr. Cogstaff is asking is that you support the state targets. Uh, when we're talking about interstates NHS, and, and I think for Director uh, Kelsey there, when you're choosing to support those state targets, you're choosing I-70 by default because they're, they're state targets. They're CDOT targets that, that you're supporting I-70 is a part of that. So I wanted to just make sure that that's clear. We have all that information available to you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, Alvin, go ahead to with uh, reliability. Thank you, Chair. So our last performance area is uh, system performance. Um, you might recall that I came before you last year and talked about half of this performance area, traffic congestion and emissions reduction. We'll be discussing the final piece today, which is travel time reliability and freight reliability. I'll start with travel time reliability. Um, the state sets two-year and four-year targets. Dr. Cog's only required to set four. There are two performance measures, the percent of person miles traveled on the interstate that are reliable and those on the non-interstate national highway system that are reliable. The calculation looks at the 80th percentile travel time compared to the 50th percentile travel time. And based on the guidance that we received, a reporting segment has to be less than 1.5 to be considered reliable. So uh, as we're looking at different time periods, looking at those reporting segments on the interstate and the non-interstate national highway system, um, if any one of those um, 
rise above 1.5 is considered unreliable and that gets considered in the calculation. Um, we are recommending we support the state's targets just based on the geography that's being used, interstate and non-interstate national highway system. Um, again, we're using CDOT's data, and so those will be realistic, achievable, and there would be no financial penalty or funding restriction on us as the MPO if we don't meet those. A quick snapshot of both travel time reliability and freight reliability. Uh, the state did meet their four-year targets, and so uh, by, uh, by um, extension, we also then met our uh, support the state's targets as well. The desired trend for travel time reliability was being above the either four-year target or the baseline value. And then for freight reliability, actually being below that four-year target of 1.5, since being below 1.5 is considered reliable. As with the previous graphs, the bar graphs on your screen are the uh, Dr. Cog data for our area that's been uh, observed from 2017 to 2021. And the horizontal lines are the four-year targets that we are recommending that we support that the state has already set. Uh, for both of these, uh, we would like to be above the targets at, uh, by the time the federal our federal partners check how we've done during that four-year period. And then there's also a separate target related to freight reliability just because freight movement's a little different than um, passenger vehicles, um, buses, cars. Uh, so Dr. Cog's only required to set four-year targets. Um, state, again, does set two-year and four-year targets. The performance measure is an index, the Truck Travel Time Reliability Index, and it only applies to the interstate system. Uh, in this case, we're looking at the 95th percentile travel time compared to the 50th percentile travel time. And we're, again, recommending we support the state's targets, and we would face no financial penalty or funding restriction by the time the four-year mark comes up to see how we've made progress on that. Um, for the Dr. Cog MPO area, we have been above 1.5 for from 2017 to 2021. Um, by the federal definition, that's considered unreliable. Uh, we are recommending we support the state's proposed four-year target of 1. Point, sorry, uh, 1. 1.46. I would note a correction on this. Um, we would like to be below 1.46, not above 1.46. So just a correction on this slide in case you um, were wondering about that uh, distinction from a previous comment I might have made. Um, because we are supporting or recommending to support the state's targets, they do use predictive modeling. Uh, if you were with us last year and you heard our presentation on traffic congestion, um, they used this model previously to assist with that target setting process. Uh, in this case, they also included reliability data, uh, historic system reliability data, and the targets themselves are also trying to take into account the potential lingering effects of COVID-19 on travel and how travel could con potentially continue to rebound um, related to reliability over the next two to four years as they set their two-year and four-year targets. So the proposed targets that Dr. Cog is recommending we support um, for travel time reliability at the four-year mark, our federal partners will look whether we were better than our baseline or better than that target setting to see whether we've made progress. And then for freight reliability, again, that would be a decrease or being lower than the baseline or lower than that four-year target of 1.46. Before I get into the last few slides, Chair, would you like me to pause here for any questions? Yes, uh, Director Harrison, go ahead. Thank you. Just a quick question in regard to go back to the graph that was two back, two slides back, right there, or one, one more. There we go. Um, considering that the proposed four target was 1.46, the lowest we've had is 1.71. Um, what would it take for us to get to that target? What's preventing us from getting even below that 1.71? And it seems pretty, pretty aggressive just based on that. Right, so the bar graphs are just for the data within the Dr. Cog MPO region. Um, the horizontal line is like the state overall. And so we are recommending that we support the state's target of 1.46. Um, the baseline value compared to the state is uh, 1.39. So they are actually below that threshold right now. Um, that 1.46 is just taking into account uh, the potential um, for increased unreliability of freight traffic in the state. Um, over the next two to four years, but still being below that 1.5 that's considered unreliable by the federal definition. And what's what's been the major factors for just unreliability from a truck travel time? What have been those biggest factors? Do we know? I would see if our CDOT partners could help with that question. 
Go ahead, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, so you, great question. It's got my, my wheels turning here. <laughs> I know that when we model this thing is we are using predictive analytics. And in the short term, so CDOT actually establishes two and four-year targets. The MPO just has to establish four-year targets. In the short term, when we look at the major influences on what the, the prediction or forecast is, is it, it's distance. And really what you're talking about is, is distance in traffic. And so I think that uh, I, I think about where I was at two years ago, I was at Costco at noon on a Wednesday. And, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't necessarily my, my travel time to do it on Saturday. I think that what the data shows is we are turning back to pre-COVID conditions. And when we're looking at the four-year target, that is having a greater effect. Things like population and the amount of VMT, that's affecting our forecast a little bit more. So we're, we're actually forecasting more of a, a return to 2018 2019 travel conditions of which we're, we're sort of expecting trucks to be in traffic a little bit longer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, Director Kelsey. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was just wondering consider I, how the modeling takes into account uh, major construction projects that are, you know, multi-year even. I just know how much um, disruption there was from both the eastbound and westbound peak period shoulder lane construction up here in Clear Creek County. And they're getting ready to start the Floyd Hill project soon. And um, I just wondered how that gets calculated into your modeling. Yeah, another great question. Luckily, I have great answers is one of the inputs that we have is from our statewide travel demand model. And in that statewide travel demand model, we put into there what our, our expected program of projects will be, not just over the next four years, but you know things that are on our 10-year plan. Uh, of course, when we're looking at that four-year period, we are looking about those things that we are absolutely sure we're, we've got funding for and, and fully intend to deliver. And so when we're putting it in the model as a project, we're able to, to estimate what the effect will be from that construction on travel time. Is that good? Director Kelsey? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. Alvin, go ahead. Uh, I think we're at the, uh, the end. We got a proposed yes. motion. Um, yeah, I would just add to uh, William's response. Um, as you've heard me mention uh, throughout the presentation, these are also just thresholds um, that come down from our federal partners. So that that one point five and how we're being how's that being calculated? How that is being calculated um, is a like a complex calculation that we're using. So um, we're looking at different time periods. So we're looking at the worst time, the worst congestion um, during that one time period, and so we're not talking about. Um, motor vehicles or even freight traffic being in bumper to bumper all the time on our interstates or national highway system. Um, we're using the, the the quirkiness of the calculations and the methodologies that have come down through guidance for each of these different performance areas. So um, a segment might be unreliable for one time period out of five, uh, but that's that then just becomes unreliable based on the calculation that we're required to use. All right, thank you. So we've um, uh, another correction on this slide. We are now before you on February 15th, uh, but both the TAC and the RTC have recommended approval of the targets as recommended. Um, we're looking to meet our deadlines at the federal level for safety by the end of this month and our infrastructure condition and reliability targets by the end of next month. Um, one thing on our four-year targets, there is an opportunity to reevaluate at the two-year mark. Uh, because we are supporting the state's targets, CDOT at the two-year mark does have the option of looking at how the data is coming out, whether they need to revise that four-year target. If that is the case, then we would be coming back before y'all at that two-year mark to revise um, a resupport of the state's targets. Mm -hmm. I would also note uh, one of our resources that's available on our webpage are a number of dashboards. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration, the Federal Transit Administration, and CDOT 
all have dashboards related to performance targets. So if you were interested in seeing how other states are doing in this, how other MPOs are doing in this, um, that's available on our webpage as well. And then our requested motion is to move to adopt a resolution establishing the 2023 safety targets and four-year pavement condition, bridge condition, travel time reliability, and freight reliability targets for the Dr. Cog MPO area as part of federal performance-based planning and programming requirements. Yeah, appreciate that very much. Uh, can I solicit a motion first and, uh, and then have discussion afterward? Director Harrison. Motion to approve the adoption resolution. Thank you. We have a second. Director Barr. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, let's ask if we have any discussion on the motion. I see no hands raised. Therefore, let's move on to the vote. All in favor of the motion on the floor to adopt the uh, resolution with the 2023 safety targets and four-year payment condition, bridge condition, travel time, reliability, and freight reliability targets for the MPO area. Please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Any abstentions? Hearing none, this motion also passes unanimously. Thank you, Alvin, for the presentation and uh, members for the discussion. The next item is discussion of state legislative issues. I believe we have in our attachment, we have nine uh, bills on which staff has uh, presented us with recommended positions. But what I would like to do, because there are nine bills here, rather than doing all of them one at a time, what I'd like to do is first, I'd like to hear uh, from uh, Rich Morrow uh, uh, going through each one and defer any questions. And then we'll put a motion on the floor and then we'll, as sort of as a consent, but then we'll pull out any for discussion if we want to make any changes because there are two in here, I believe, that staff is recommending that we propose or that we support amended positions uh, on the bills in question. So with that, uh, Rich, can you go ahead and run through all of the uh, all of the nine bills? And then we will uh, uh, we'll make a motion and then uh, discuss any uh, call outs from that motion. That sounds good, uh, Mr. Chair, and I will do this fairly quickly. Um, and I'll note, uh, particularly for uh, newer board members, the pattern that we use in this uh, list of bills or matrix, well, we attempt to basically give you a, a summary of the bill with its basic information in terms of its sponsors and status. Um, the bill number is a link to the bill on the legislature's website. We have a column for the FN is for fiscal notes, which is also a link if a fiscal, fiscal note exists. And then we, we have these other columns uh, with the staff comments uh, to um, give, you know, highlight any kind of extra analysis or, or point of information on the bill. And finally, uh, tie any comments and the recommended position to adopted board policy, which you, you adopted the uh, state legislative policy statement um, last month. Uh, so with that, I'll, I, I won't take too much time. Again, on uh, the uh, first bill under aging, um, the Senate bill two is a, uh, a uh, bill being put forth by the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing. Um, we're not sure that it directly affects Dr. Cog, so we're monitoring it right now, and I'm attempting to get with uh, staff to discuss a little bit more about how it may or may not relate to the work that we do. So at this point, uh, just asking to, to be able to continue to monitor the bill. Um, Senate Bill 31 is... Uh, it's titled Healthcare Access for Older Coloradans. What it really deals with is um, initiating some state support for university programs that um, provide uh, additional specialty training for healthcare providers in geriatric care. And um, we've this uh, Colorado has a has, is severely lacking in. Uh, healthcare professionals with geriatric training, um, particularly 
since we have the second fastest growing over 60 population in the country. And um, so I'm asking to be able to support that. We, we hear, we've heard stories many times over the years from clients and, and sometimes in our own families of, of problems dealing with uh, providers that don't really understand some of the unique needs that older adults may have. Uh, so we're asking for a support on that one. Um, Senate Bill 64, um, we're asking for a support position on uh, the Office of Public Guardianship, uh, which is different than what you might think of in terms of uh, guardians for children and so forth. This specifically relates to a program that was started up by the legislature, I believe it was 2017, um, to provide for the state to appoint guardians for older adults who basically have no one, no family members or friends who could be a guardian. Um, the, the legislature created the program, uh, didn't really fund it until 2019. It was supposed to be a pilot project in Denver, I believe in, um, I'm sorry, the county where, uh, is it Otero, I think, where La Junta is? Um, and then I think it was in Montrose County. Um, they ended up only having enough money to do the pilot project in Denver, but they did do that and report and um, have data uh, uh, that has been uh, developed on that. And now they're back with um, a bill to continue the office and um, begin to fund it, phase in funding over the next few years so that the office can extend services throughout the state. So those are the three aging bills that we have. We have three transportation bills. Um, Senate Bill 16 is one of the ones we asked to amend. And um, that one basically is related to the additional uh, greenhouse gas targets that the bill um, includes. I believe it's for it 2035 and uh, 2045, and then the, I think I might have that right. And then um, increasing the target for 2050 to 1000 or 100%. And so I'm assuming we may wanna have some conversation about that. Uh, right now, we just have it as a recommendation for amend. Um, the, the next bill is a Senate House Bill 1101 and um, certainly strongly support the, uh, at least I think we do, the uh, um, uh, extension of the uh, ozone uh, free transit grant, grant uh, program. Our concern uh, relates uh, as far as possible amendment relates to the language in the bill. Um, it's really at the end of the bill tacked on addressing uh, transit agency representation on transportation planning organizations, particularly uh, including MPOs, and um, the wording we fe feel is somewhat vague as to whether or not Dr. Cog's current arrangement um, for the MPO uh, would would uh, be covered already under this bill, or if we would have to make some uh, changes uh, to meet the bill's requirements. So that's a, the other one that uh, we thought you might want to call out. Um, the last transportation bill is a safety related bill. Um, we feel is tied to um, Vision Zero plan. And um, it's, and actually this bill just passed out of its first committee. Um, and this is the move over or slow down for stationary vehicles. And we're recommending a support on that. And finally, another three bills on housing. Um, Senate Bill One is the, uh, uh, P3 program uh, to partner on possible development of uh, um, vacant unused state property, state land or vacant empty buildings and so forth uh, for uh, affordable housing. And then um, Senate Bill 35 is more of a cleanup and update, I guess, of the Middle Income Housing Authority bill that was passed last year. And this one um, extends, or uh, I think expands the, um, uh, and let's see, the uh, board of the authority. And um, I think 
cleans up some of the language and its responsibilities. And we're asking for a support position on that. And um, the last one we have, um, uh, it, uh, there are, as a matter of fact, probably at least a half a dozen landlord tenant related bills out there um, and probably more to come. But right now, the only one that we're presenting to you that's related to that is this House Bill 1115, which I'm sure you've all heard about, is um, a straight repeal of the statute that prohibits uh, rent control. Um, and that one we're just asking uh, for a position of monitor. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Um, as I said uh, before, what I'd like to do is to get this on the floor. Uh, I, my intention uh, as a Denver representative, and I think my uh, colleague from the administration side, uh, Nick Williams, I uh, intend to abstain because we have not had a chance uh, as a uh, as a city and county of Denver, we have a working group that takes a look at bills and then adopts a Denver position. And so, uh, although I might personally support or maybe oppose uh, bills that come before us, I'm not here to vote my personal feeling, but to represent the uh, view of the city. Uh, so uh, Nicholas and I will probably uh, will abstain on on this. I want to put it on the floor and then ask members to. Uh, we will individually discuss any ones that need discussing. And if there are some that uh, that uh, no one no one has any uh, uh, concern about, we can just let that continue on the consent. So let me ask for a motion to approve the staff recommendations first, so we can get it on the floor for action. This is Lisa. I move to approve the staff recommendation on these bills. Thank you, uh, Director Levy. Oh yes, and I'm happy to second that. And I also when the Okay, uh, your audio I'm broke up a little bit. You, um, discussing some. Your audio broke up a little bit. Did you second that? I did. I'm going to turn my camera off. But I think my internet's. Okay. Uh, now, as I mentioned, uh, I'm sure there are bills on here that uh, we're going to have a lot of discussion on. So let let me go uh, down the list uh, one by one, and ask uh, if anyone wants to pull out uh, any any of the three bills on aging. Uh, uh, Senate Bill 2 was to monitor. Senate Bill 31 was to support. Senate Bill 64 was to support. Uh, does anybody want to call out any of those? Director Levy. Director Levy. Hello? Am I not coming through? Uh, hey. uh, I'm now I to, hear you. Am I here? Now I hear you. Go ahead. Okay. I think my sat my dish that well, no, I don't have that anymore from Okay, your audio is cut out again. Why I'm having a sort of better going ahead and taking oh. I'd like us to take a support position on Senate Bill. Probably mm. Senate Bill 2. Are you saying Senate Bill 2, Director? I put, put it in the chat. OK, thank you. Yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, and I don't, I'll just talk. I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> um, I think it, as, I, as I read the question, Okay, well, as I read the question, I'll just try to talk fast and not stop. As I read the staff mm -hmm. would qualify as community health workers, I, I think it'd be really important to support this bill. Um, and I would just say that that's the one issue that I would... It would I was just going to say that's that was the question that, that I was trying to get an answer to as to whether or not... Um, our staff would would qualify as community health workers. Well, I guess what what I would say is that I think it's important to support it, even if they would not, because sure. of the benefits to older adults uh, uh, and communities workers. Which, if 
All right. Thank you. Yeah, the uh, Medicaid waiver, it would provide additional funding for those services. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Director Mulvey. Hi, yeah, I'm also interested in the definition of community health workers because there are a lot of volunteers down in Douglas County um, who would be interested in that. My second um, concern is more of a question on SB 64. Um, JD 23 is going to be stood up. Um, Commissioner Teal fully engaged in that. But my question is, would the funding um, of six million dollars pay for all of the counties and the prospective JD 23, or is it going to be doled out based on grants or what? Um, I do not know. Um, I it's my understanding is that it is um, it's a state general fund appropriation, although there then there uh, there will be some fees that are charged. And I don't know that I have the detail as to how they they uh, plan to build out um, coverage. Uh, obviously, funding has been a big part of it. Um, and that's part of the reason I think why they're they're doing this to phase phase out or phase in the expansion. Um, because the um, they're they're also phasing in the funding, and they would do the expansion as they get more funding. Um, Thank you. I'll, I'll follow it um, on okay. the outside. As and well. if I get any additional uh, detail or learn any more about it, I'd be happy to follow up with you, Director. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Harrison. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would move with uh, Director Levy in terms of SBO to to support. Um, for those who remember my soliloquy a couple weeks back in regard to own story about my uncle who is mentally handicapped as well as uh, aging. He's 77 years old. And um, the fact that he was on, he was left without a home right before COVID started and we were lucky to find him emergency housing and then get him stabilized. I think there's a lot more families out there that are going through that sort of experience in Colorado because of the funding that's inadequate for for them uh, mm -hmm. to stay in homes. And I, I think the big thing that I just wanted more clarity on was independently in their homes and communities, what do we classify as independent? For him, he's independent. He can do certain things in a group home that he's in. And does this cover group homes and host homes uh, for those folks? And that's where I wanted kind of clarity on the language of that. Okay, I, I will definitely get a clarification and I'll make a note to follow up with you, Director. Yeah, and there's and there's a number of people that are good, upstanding people who are opening their homes for host homes as well as for group homes. And so giving them the support that they need to be able to handle uh, uh, individuals that have disabilities and are aging at the same time or either or uh, is is pretty significant to, to help them, uh, those vulnerable populations. So Great. thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ed Bowditch in the chat, I made a note on this. Ed, do you want to uh, uh, to come on and uh, speak to that for the directors here? Sure, the question, uh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. The question about Senate Bill 64, the Office of Public Guardianship. Um, the plan in the bill is to ramp it up and expand it, but it does say that all of the, that all the services would be available throughout the state in all judicial districts by 2028. So even in the district in the 23rd that is going to be created in 2025, um, this would be expanded to include that by then. Mm -hmm. Great. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me, uh, let me do this because uh, it's been proposed that we change the uh, staff recommendation from monitor to support uh, on, uh, uh, Senate Bill 2, let me ask if the members here and voting, uh, so if you support changing that and incorporating that in the in the ultimate motion that we vote on, uh, use the raise hand function and we'll take a hand count. Uh, so if you are a voting director, uh, if you support 
uh, changing the recommendation from monitor to support for Senate Bill 2, please raise your hand. And Melinda, when we're uh, when all the hands are finished going up, can you count them? Let's see, 15, 17, 18, 19. Okay, I see 20, 21. Let me give it another uh, 10 seconds if people can't find the hand function. 22, I believe it takes 29 to approve. Uh, this, um, if, uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. It's um, for the, for positions on bills, it's uh, two thirds of those present and voting. Right. And right so it's now, not two thirds of the membership, but just two thirds correct. of those present and voting. Correct. And I was saying 29 reflects the reflects two thirds of those here who are present. Uh, okay, that looks like we have how many? Sorry, Mr. Chair, I'm just doing another quick count. Okay. So I see 25, but I would also need to know who is abstaining from this vote in order to give right. you an accurate count. Okay, so everybody take your hands down. There were 25 in favor. All of those abstaining as of right, uh, Director Kraftharp, if you could take your hand down. Oh, you're She's abstaining. Okay, if you're abstaining, raise your hand. <laughs> Any other abstentions? Six. Okay, I, I hesitate to do math on the fly, Melinda. I hope you have a calculator. Yes, I'm vote. doing it right now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we would need 25 to pass the vote. And that's what we had. And that's what we had. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So the uh, the motion now will include a position of support on Senate Bill 2. Great. Let's go on to the transportation bills. Uh, Rich, uh, yeah. if you can get them up on the screen and I can go back to my PDF. Uh, Senate Bill 16, House Bill 1101, Bill 1123. We have on two of those, we have the recommendations from staff that we uh, support an amendment to the bill. And uh, Rich, remind us again on Senate Bill 16, this is the bill that has a provision that would insert some mid, uh, some uh, midpoints along the way in the greenhouse gas reduction. And it would require some CDOT uh, revised rulemaking and for us to go through, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I think at this point, I would ask uh, uh, Director Doug Rex or Ron to jump in and help me out. <laughs> no, okay. thank, th thank you, Doug. I didn't. I was on the other screen. I didn't see your hand up. Go uh, no worries. No, thank you very much. And actually, I, I was going to suggest that that Ron provide a little bit more background on on what we're, we're suggesting. What we're suggesting, Ron, Great. you you on? I'm here, Chair uh, Chair Flynn, Directors. Happy to speak to Senate Bill 16. Um, Senate Bill 16 includes a, a number of measures that are state initiatives to help the state achieve reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, our recommendation to amend the bill really focuses on the issue of the greenhouse gas reduction targets that were adopted into statute in House Bill 19-1261. Um, uh, House Bill 1261 set reduction targets for uh, the years 25, 30, and 2050 from a 2005 baseline. Um, this, this bill would uh, add additional reduction targets for the years uh, 2035, 2040, and 2045, so three additional horizon years and increase the reduction level um, in statute for 2050 from a 90% reduction from the 2005 level to 100% reduction. Um, and the way the statute is structured and because of Senate Bill um, 
to 60 in um, 21, um, there is a clear line between these targets set in statute through the greenhouse gas reduction roadmap to the greenhouse gas reduction transportation planning rule that CDOT adopted last year. And well, uh, and we spent um, about a year complying with through an update and review of our regional transportation plan. Um, our, our concern is really about ratcheting those up so quickly after we've just gone through that process to comply with, with the existing rule and the potential of having to redo that work while we're trying to make progress and implement the work that you all did with us on updating the regional transportation plan. So we'd like to work with the sponsor to amend the bill to deal with, with those impacts mitigate those impacts, maybe sever that relationships or, or clarify that relationship between the target or not include these interim targets. Um, part of the issue is a workload um, standpoint. Uh, we've already established under achieving the rules for, for instance, achieving the, the horizon year targets for 2030, 2040, and 2050, adding a five-year in, in, uh, interim target of 2035 and 2045 is an enormous amount of additional work for us just to model that, let alone try to achieve those targets. Um, so that's that's our recommendation is to amend the bill. Thank you. Uh, can you, uh, Rich or Doug or Ron, talk about the uh, second uh, 11, House Bill 1101 where we are uh, asking for an amendment as well? I think you, you want me. Happy, happy to happy to happy to cover it, Mr. Chair. <laughs> yep. So sure. House Bill House Bill 1101. There's some really good policy in here about expanding and giving some additional flexibility around the um, transit transit service grants during high ozone season. Uh, the one the one sec the the two sections section two and section three of the bill though um, do require. Um, T TPOs, transportation planning organizations, which include metropolitan planning organizations, which Dr. Cox hosts and serves as an MPO uh, in this state, as you all know, uh, to include uh, a representative of a uh, operating transit agency within, within the region on its, on its board. Uh, you all know that our MPO decision-making process includes the Regional Transportation Committee on which RTD has four seated members um, out of that. And we feel like that is the appropriate representation uh, and actually better representation than giving them one voting member out of 59 board members um, on the board of directors. Uh, Dr. Cog is, is a little unique. Dr. Cog is more than an MPO. Uh, Dr. Cog is an agency that hosts the MPO, but the MPO really is the RTC and the board of directors together. We'd like to seek amendment to the bill to clarify that our current arrangement of having voting members from RTD on the Regional Transportation Committee meets the intent of what the bill sponsor is trying to achieve. Hey. Mr. Chairman, if I may just add on to that, uh, great synopsis of Ron, is that the reason why we believe our current structure, and Ron is right, we're not a little unique, we are unique in this respect, that we that our metropolitan planning organization uh, decision-making process is the way that it is. Not very many, if any, have a regional transportation committee operate the way that we operate. At, in, in our current process, RTD is more empowered with their seats on RTC than they would be under this this under this language, because the, the board should remember that any issue as it relates to transportation planning in our region, it requires an affirmative vote of both the board and the, the RTC. They both have to approve the same motion. And if they do not, then the board, then the, the action gets sent back to the RTC and then there's it's negotiated between the RTC and the board. So it's a, it's a powerful, powerful body that the RTC and and uh, RTD is well represented on that committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Certainly. And I think there's also the uh, anomalous situation of, uh, I think I see uh, Brian Welch from RTD uh, supports the RTC approach currently in place. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're all talking about you here as being a non-voting <laughs> member. And I wanted to point out also that uh, 
Uh, we also have a members of the board, non-voting members from CDOT and from the governor's office. And to uh, legislatively require that RTD uh, be a voting member of the board of directors uh, without recognizing that CDOT and the governor's office are also here as non-voting members is a little anomalous. Uh, so uh, uh, if I were to uh, not abstain on this and wait for Denver to take a position, uh, I would suggest that the amendment is, is right and proper. And I appreciate Brian Welch's uh, comment. Uh, do we have any discussion on either of the amendments, uh, the bills that we recommend be amended or the one that we are recommending support? Director Mulvey, go ahead. Hi, I don't know what happened to my video, so sorry about that. Um, yeah, my concern is that I really would like to support the position to seek the amendment, but it's so much of an omnibus style bill that has many things in it that I don't have authority to vote on and may be inclined to go in another direction based on my city's position that it's putting us in a difficult spot. So are we support if amend or are we seek amendment? And then it comes back to us. I don't sense. want to get into the details of something you know, there's there's a lot of stuff in this thing that has nothing to do with what we're focusing on here today. Thank you. And if I could add to that, is, uh, is the implication that if it's not amended, that we would oppose it? I, I think that's uh, sort of the uh, corollary to your to your question, Director Mulvey. Uh, Doug, do you want to speak to that, or Ron? Well, that's a really great question. Um, you know, I think. From staff's perspective, that we're supportive of the other elements of the bill, um, right. we were ultimately just seeking clarification on that on that one point. Okay. Uh, and if I might, Mr. Chair, yeah. I mean certainly this we this will come back next yeah. month at the next board meeting, and then you can take a position to uh, change you know change the position to support if that's the board's will, mm -hmm. depending on how. The, is anybody Any, carrying an amendment? Yeah, if, if this gets taken care of. Yeah. Uh, Rich, do you know, is someone willing to carry this amendment? Either um, of them? We, we've had some initial conversations. Um, we're planning to speak with one of the sponsors. Mm -hmm. And so um, until we have that conversation, after that, we'll try to tie up uh, sponsors for the amendment. It might be the sponsor of the bill. Even. Okay, and you're referring to both bills that we're seeking amendments. Um, in that case, I was talking about 1101. Thank you, Director Levy. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Director Levy. Lowered my hand. Oh no, I guess I didn't. I'm sorry. There you go. I'm not hearing you. Director Levy. I lowered my hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the final three bills, the housing bills. We have uh, two bills that were that staff is recommending that we support, and one which is the repeal of the local residential rent control uh, prohibition. Uh, the position is monitor. And so uh, let me ask, is there any desire to uh, call out one of these for any changes to those recommendations? I don't see, uh, Rich, I don't see any bills here on uh, uh, the big topic at hand that a lot of us have been discussing related to housing and uh, uh, the potential for the state to uh, look into overriding local land use. Uh, have there been any bills introduced on that yet? Um, no, I, I would have to say no. I mean, we can, okay. we hear different things at different times, but, um, and, and of course there's been like the ones that are on this list, there's about a half a dozen, as I said, other more landlord tenant kinds of bills. Yes. Um, there's, I think, some other smaller bills, again, floating 
around in draft form, but I, I and I might ask Ed and Jen if they have something to add uh, or anyone else, because everybody <laughs> I, I think has been having different conversations. Um, we're still waiting for what we think will be like the bill, um, maybe in a few weeks. I don't know. Okay, I, I do know that my uh, <laughs> my own state representative Mabry is uh, is supporting a just cause eviction uh, bill. Yeah, uh, but I don't know yep. if that's been filed yet. It I has. Do... It has been introduced. It has. Yes, it has. Okay, thank you. I uh, I would note that uh, on one hand, uh, the uh, the uh, bill uh, House Bill 1115 uh, repealing the prohibition and giving local jurisdictions. Uh, control over whether to have rent stabilization uh, on one hand, and then we have discussion of taking away local control over land use on the other hand. So I'm curious what the legislature's uh, ultimate direction is going to be on this. Uh, any other discussion on these three recommended uh, positions? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, then we do have a motion on the floor that was amended by a uh, two thirds uh, vote to change the recommended position on house on uh, Senate Bill Two to uh, support from monitor. I believe. Let me go back up to that. Uh, yes, yeah, Senate Bill Two uh, major a two thirds majority changed the recommendation from monitor to support. Uh, uh, Director Levy, how do you recommend we take action when our jurisdictions have taken positions that deviate from what Dr. Cog's staff is recommending? For example, we are requesting the amendments to 16 for different reasons. We don't have a position on that. Okay. Uh, I would suggest abstention, unless you want to pull one out for a separate vote. Uh, Director Levy, would you like to pull out Senate Bill 16 and 1123 for separate votes? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Was that a yes? I Yes. I I'm sorry, could you type it in the chat? Would anyone else like to would anyone else like to pull out a bill in the event that your jurisdiction is taking a position different from the Dr. Cox staff recommendation? Seeing none, let's have a separate vote then on Senate Bill 16. Uh, Rich, could you go down to 16? Yeah. That's the greenhouse gas. Yeah. Um, let me call for a vote on this. Well, actually, would someone like to make a motion that we support the staff recommendation uh, that we support the amendment as outlined by staff to Senate Bill 16? Director Shaw. I would make that motion, yes. Thank you. Uh, this is may not a okay. point of order, please. Yes. Mm -hmm. May the motion specify that if if there's an amendment, it'll come back to us for a vote and consideration. Certainly. Uh, Thank you. It will come yes. back uh, next month. Uh, and as, as we brought out during the question with Rich, if the amendment is included, uh, then we can take a vote on whether to support the bill as amended. And if it is not included, we can take a vote on that basis. Great. Okay. Thank you. If if uh, Director Shaw agrees to that friendly amendment of that motion. I would second that. Yeah, and then uh, Director Levy's got a pertinent question in the chat. Can we approve the positions on the agenda other than sixteen and one eleven twenty? Yes, we will. Well, both of uh, those out. Yes, I want to. I want to do the call outs first, though, to so that they're taken out of the final motion on the other bills. Because uh, if we voted on the motion as it is right now, we would include these bills. So we're pulling out 16. Let me uh, call for a vote. Uh, Director Shaw, do you have a question? Okay, thank you. Let me call for a vote on uh, uh, supporting the staff recommendation that Dr. Cog board uh, is seeking an amendment to Senate Bill 16 uh, to uh, remove the uh, proposed changes to the greenhouse gas emission reduction mm -hmm. goals during those interim uh, those interim targets that were inserted in the bill. Uh, we need 29. If everyone present is voting, uh, 
If not, uh, hmm. take the abstentions out later. So if you support this position, please raise your hand and Melinda will count them. Okay. All right, give it a few more seconds. It looks like we have 23. All right, everyone take your hands down. If you are voting no on this, please raise your hand if you're voting no. Okay, three, four, five. Okay, uh, take your hands down. If you are abstaining, take your hands down. I mean, if you're abstaining, raise your hand. Six. Any other votes? All right. Melinda, can you do that math? It was. Uh, it was 23 and four opposed and six abstaining. That's correct. So uh, with the abstentions, we had 23 in favor and five against. Um, so we would be at, what is that? Uh, 18 in favor. Okay. All right. So we do support uh, asking for this amendment. Now let me, let's move on to 1123. That is the uh, bill where we are seeking the amendment on uh, clarifying whether RTD's representation on the RTC meets the requirement that's in the bill. Uh, and if it doesn't, uh, we'll um, come Mr. back. Chair? Yes, sir. Um, maybe clarify with Director Levy, because uh, that's different. The 1101 is the transit agency representation on the board. Oh, am I looking at the wrong one here? 1101, I'm sorry. Director Levy, you wanted to vote on 1123. Move over and slow down. Or 1101. It's not taking a position on, oh, okay. Okay, so we're taking it out, so you're going to take no position if it's part of the package. Great. Okay, All right, so thank you. Uh, so okay. th thank you for that clarification. So this is 1123, uh, the move over and slow down. Uh, and uh, Director Levy wants that out to be voted separately because Boulder County hasn't taken a position. And uh, if, it were in, if it were part of the overall motion, she would not be able to vote on that. So all in favor of the staff position on 1123, please raise your hand. Looks like 23, are there any more? Okay, uh, take your hands down. All opposed to the staff recommendation on 1123, please raise your hand if you are opposed to it. Two. All right, take your hands down. All those abstaining on this motion, raise your hand. Thank you, uh, Melinda. I don't think I even need to do the math on that. It looks like two thirds is easily achieved. Correct. Did you get the numbers though? I did. Great. Okay. Thank you. Now, with the exceptions of, uh, let me go back to the uh, to the agenda. Uh, Senate Bill Two, which we already voted on, and uh, eleven twenty three. And uh, 
uh, 16, with those three removed, the, the remaining six bills, the motion now on the floor then is to uh, approve the recommended position of staff on those six other bills. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. I count 27. Uh, Melinda, is that your count? That is correct. Great. Okay. Take your hands down, please. If there are any opposed to the staff positions on the remaining six bills in the motion, please raise your hand now. I see one. Anyone else? Seeing none, uh, Director Dietz, uh, take your hand down. And uh, all those opposed, I'm sorry, all those abstaining, uh, please raise your hand. Okay, the math is clear to me on that, Melinda. Did you get the count? I see eight abstentions. Yes, Mr. Chair, I did. Excellent. All right. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your participation in that process of so many unrelated bills and so many different positions that's, that our members are taking and those that haven't taken one. Uh, it's a bit complicated and messy. It's like, this is what they mean when they say it's like making sausage, right? Uh, the next item thank is- Thank you committee. all so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Rich. Thank you, Ed and Jennifer for being here, by the way. Uh, committee reports next. Uh, we have first report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee from my old pal, Nick Williams. Go ahead, Nick. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Stack met in February, beginning of the month. Uh, two kind of more major items of note. The first, uh, a kickoff of the development of the next statewide uh, transportation plan uh, on here. Uh, the action item for this was really to decide about what form either committee, full committee, subcommittee, uh, the staff wanted to take to make recommendations for funding disbursements. And I don't think I have to tell this group how important uh, it is to make sure that um, uh, the Dr. Cog region's priorities are communicated and reflected uh, as we get into these funding um, uh, uh, allocations and disbursement methods uh, on there. Uh, ultimately, the, the stack voted to uh, uh, take take the discussion as a full committee uh, with an expectation or a, a, a thought that we would have to defer down to a subcommittee for maybe some more technical analysis. Um, certainly felt that this warranted a, a subcommittee on that, but um, 14 to one uh, on that. So was not successful on that, but certainly it is a very important topic. I'm happy to keep the board apprised of this as it moves along. The second uh, deals with the transportation alternatives program or TAP, a federal source of funding uh, for uh, non-traditional kind of multimodal and different uh, uh, types of, of projects here. Um, previous, uh, previously uh, uh, the project selection through CDOT has been done on a, a region-wide basis. There's been a shift um, that there will be a, uh, the a project selection committee will be managed through the headquarters uh, on that. And uh, each region will have a review committee made up of uh, TPR chairs, so their designees, a CDOT region representative and CDOT HQ representative. So I believe uh, Dr. Cog leadership will um, work with our chair to get a designee to participate in that. And then just to note, draft applications due on March 24th. Uh, final applications will be due on April 21st. And so in between there, uh, an engineer review will take place and, and, and uh, applicants will receive uh, feedback on that. So I'll stop there. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Certainly. Any questions for Nick on, on the stack? Seeing none, the next report is from Metro Mayor's Caucus, Mayor Starker. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. The uh, caucus met as a full caucus on February 1st. Our first order of business was a legislative update on uh, housing infrastructure and, and the public safety bills that are moving through the legislature. We had uh, Kevin Bomber with CEO, 
the CML uh, with us, and uh, Megan McKillop, the uh, legislative and policy advocate, and had a good discussion on that. We also had a, a discussion on caucus business, uh, discussing our policy principles, uh, our uh, M Metro Mayor's Caucus uh, Primer. We taught at a presentation with uh, Civic Results on the uh, relationship with Civic Results and the Metro Mayor's Caucus. We discussed briefly a job search for our executive director, and we had a discussion on the programming events for 2023. Uh, that would conclude my report. Thank you very much. Any questions for uh, Director Starker on Metro Mayors? Seeing none, Dr Director Baker, you are up for uh, Metro Area County Commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our first meeting for 2023 will be this Friday in the Dr. Cog offices. Um, so it'll be the first meeting. We have all the meetings scheduled for 2023, and we just want to thank Dr. Cog for allowing us to use your facilities to meet. And that concludes my report. Excellent. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, report from the Advisory Committee on Aging from Jayla Sanchez Warren. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Um, at our meeting, uh, I provided a presentation on the changes in the Older Americans Act. This is the federal law that gives us our authority and provides regulatory guidance. The, uh, there was a lot of changes, but I'll highlight just a few. The law now encourages partnerships that bring in outside funding, meaning non-AAA dollars, that includes health, uh, health payers and even private pay services to support community-based services. Um, it encourages transportation coordination and mobility management as the need for transportation continues to grow and increases family caregiver supports and services. Um, follow up on the aging summit. You may remember that the summit uh, was a gathering of county councils on aging and city commissions on aging. The attendees asked for our support in their local efforts. So a small subcommittee was formed um, and we are working on how best we can support county councils and uh, city commissions on aging. We'll be offering a series of four educational programs. The first will be offered on February 27th that will cover demographic information on the aging population in the region. And it will be presented by our own RPD staff um, followed by a presentation on the results of the consumer satisfaction survey of older adults that we conducted in the last quarter of 2022. The third one will be on the area plan on aging, um, our four-year area plan on aging, which I'm working on now. And then um, the fourth one will be effective advocacy tips and tools. After that, Director Conklin and uh, uh, Director Shaw gave a Dr. Cog uh, board report, and then we had county council reports. Great. Thank you. Is that it? Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Seeing none, let's move on to uh, Executive Director Rex with the Regional Air Quality Council. Thank you, sir, very much. Uh, the Regional Air Quality Council met on January 27th, and uh, few items. The first one, uh, each year they recognize a, an entity that demonstrates a commitment to improving air quality in the region. And this year, their clean air champion, they recognize ACE Hardware for their above and beyond environmental improvement efforts. So that was kind of cool. We also got um, an update on their public education campaign, Pain, Simple Steps, Better Air. Uh, just kind of a wrap up of the 2022 highlights, as well as uh, what they're planning on uh, changing and, and uh, moving forward with in 2023. And lastly, that I'll mention is that um, they're uh, beginning again to, um, you may recall the Air Quality Control Committee, Commission adopted the full moderate ozone SIP uh, back in December 2022. Um, as it related to the severe ozone SIP, there were some calculations that required certain chapters of the of that SIP to have to be redone. So they're in the process now of scoping out what that looks like, and there will be a lot of work being done by the RAC as well as um, the State Department of Health in the over the spring period. So with that, Mr. Chairman, that's my report. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, next up is uh, E470 Authority Director Mulvey. 
Hi, a large part of the meeting this week was on the year end review of financials. A couple of highlights are um, relate to usage. There is greater, um, greater use by multi axle vehicles, which are trucks, um, using them for actual transportation and logistics. And there's also greater use uh, from origin to origin, point of origin routes, which is um, basically making it your primary route. Um, revenue increased a little bit. There's uh, toll rates are the same. And there's a nice increase in web accounts. The other annual review uh, item was on customer survey results. There's more website interaction. And then the other two items had to do with interchanges or items of interest to the group. There uh, is an IGA for the 64th Avenue interchange. The work on that will be managed by the city of Aurora. And the Jewel Avenue interchange is going to receive some temporary signals. So I think users will appreciate all of that. That is it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've been to a lot of Zoom meetings where I wished I could hide in the shrubbery as well. I have no idea. What oh, happened. that's really that's okay. my award-winning parsley from the Douglas <laughs> County Fair. I just Thank don't know you. where my face went. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. A report from CDOT, uh, Director Pakvas. Thank you, Chair. Uh, appreciate uh, attending this evening. Um, uh, a couple of updates on, on personnel issues. Um, as you know, since I am here, Rebecca White um, has left CDOT at the end of last month. Uh, she will be missed greatly. Um, I am the interim director of the Department of the Division of Transportation Development until a new director has been hired. Additionally, uh, Steve Harrelson, our chief engineer, has retired after um, a couple of decades of service here in uh, the department. Uh, his deputy, Keith Stefanik, is now the new chief engineer at CDOT. Um, the uh, raise grants is part of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. Uh, the uh, applications for 2023 is due at the end of this month, and uh, there are two projects that are being submitted for these grants. Colorado 119 Safety and Mobility Improvement Projects, which is being submitted by Boulder County with the support of CDOT, and the 6th and Wadsworth Interchange Reconstruction Project, which is resubmitting with a new benefit cost analysis, um, but it was designated a project of merit during the 2022 cycle. Um, and that uh, concludes my report for this one. Thank you. Thank you very much. And welcome. Uh, next up is a report from RTD, Brian Welch. Thank you, Chair Flynn. You've saved the best for last. Certainly. Uh, just really quickly to, uh, to Dr. Cog. Good evening, everybody. The uh, Yes, last night, the RTD Finance and Planning Committee introduced the uh, new fare study and equity analysis. We, you probably have read quite a bit about that, which features lower fares, simplicity, and a lot of other features that I think many people are gonna be very supportive of. The meeting went very well. We got some strong support in the three people that commented, so that was encouraging. Uh, just about 15 minutes ago, the uh, Operations and Safety Committee approved changes to the RTD code of conduct that deal with the safety and security of our system. Two other quick things, the uh, you probably heard a judge ruled that RTD is not responsible for more than $100 million worth of claims that were made against the Eagle project. Um, can you believe that was that project opened in 2016 and that lawsuit was filed in 2018 related to the flagger? So justice moves forward. And then finally, RTD hosted two very well attended open houses on the Northwest Rail Study on January 31st and February 2nd in Boulder and Westminster. So thank you, Dr. Cog and Chair Flynn. Thank you, Brian. As the former uh, communications project manager for the Eagle Project, uh, I was unaware of that. I knew there was still pending. And that happened just, re just uh, within uh, uh, today. It was last Friday. Last Friday. I didn't see any news on that. Did it get into the news? Yes. It did? Jeez. Yeah, I'm a retired journalist, too. I should have known that. <laughs> Heavens. Well, uh, thank you, and congratulations. Uh, there is one informational item, <clears throat> uh, item 14, uh, TIP administrative modifications. Please look them over. And uh, next is administrative items. Our next meeting is exactly four weeks from tonight. 
March 15th. Uh, hopefully there is not another snowstorm uh, and we'll be back in person. But as you know, March is our snowiest month uh, in Denver and in Colorado. Uh, other matters by members. Do members have other matters they wish to bring up? Give you a second. I see none. So with no other matters by members, we can officially adjourn. Thank you, everybody, for being in attendance tonight. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank Take you, care. Thank Thank you everybody. Good night. 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 Good night.